welcome back to Psychedelics Today, everybody. This is your host, Kyle Buller. Joe wasn't able to make this call today, so this is just a call with uh, me and our guest, Robin. Today, I get to chat with Robin Curlin West, uh, a licensed marriage and family therapist based out of California. Robin enrolled in our Navigating Psychedelics course a few months ago, and that's how we got connected. And she has been offering integration services uh, through her therapy practice. And Robin reached out to just ask some questions, I guess, uh, getting some challenges on like, what is psychedelic integration? How am I serving people um, in this integration realm? And so, you know, I was, we, we had some dialogue back and forth between some of the issues she was having or, or some of these challenges. And Joe and I thought, hey, this would be a great opportunity to just get some of these challenges out there. Uh, we know that, you know, there, there are some therapists doing integration work that listen to this show. And, you know, maybe you are a therapist and you're running into some similar problems. Um, this is kind of a new territory on, like, how do you provide psychedelic integration services? You know, do you get into harm reduction? Are you just doing post uh, or pre and post uh, work? So helping people prepare for an experience or journey and then following up. And, you know, Robin had some good questions on, like, how soon do I, like, really get in contact with somebody uh, before they get into a, a psychedelic experience? Or, you know, how how long do I wait until I follow up after an experience? So there's, you know, a bunch of different challenges as this as this field is growing and this topic of providing integration services is kind of growing and um, getting some traction and it, it's kind of like a new area and I think we're all trying to figure it out together so this conversation is more of a dialogue and just trying to do some brainstorming together and you know maybe I I, I kind of just put in some of my two cents on maybe how I'd approach this or or whatnot so, yeah, I think this is a really interesting episode. It's a little bit different than what we've had before, but I think it will be of great value if you do provide any integration services or thinking about providing those in the future, whether you're a therapist, a coach, or, you know, whatever practice you're, you're doing. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Robin Curlin West and let us know what you think. All right. Welcome back to Psychedelics Day, everybody. This is Kyle. We are here with Robin Curlin West, a licensed marriage and family therapist out of uh, Sacramento, out of California. Welcome to the show, Robin. Glad to have you on Thank here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. So you actually enrolled in our Navigating Psychedelics course a couple months ago, and that's how we connected. And then you reached out to us about just some like general questions about integration and working with clients. Uh, in the integration realm. And this seems like a pretty new territory for a lot of folks. And so we thought it would be great to have you on the show and kind of, you know, just have a conversation about some of these questions that are coming up. And, you know, I think there's probably other therapists that listen to this show that are kind of like, hmm, how do I navigate this space? So absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm curious to yeah learn what you're running up against and yeah, maybe how to navigate this. So yeah, thanks. And uh, if you want to give a little background about how you got interested in psychedelics or a little bit about your therapy work and, and your journey, that'd be great. Sure. Absolutely. First, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. I love the work that you and Joe are doing. This It's such an important platform. It's really important to get the message out about all the different aspects of psychedelic integration therapy. And maybe later on, I'll mention a couple of the podcasts that really were helpful for me in terms of education and tools. So um, first I, I'll say, so I was um, licensed in 2010. I graduated from the California Institute of Integral Studies in 2006. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It was a wonderful experience. And since then I had done, you know, various nonprofits um, as clinical director, lead therapist. Um, and then when I moved out to this area, I decided to do private practice. Personally, what led me to be so fascinated with this particular work is about a year ago, um, it was last April, I decided to do what I was calling a karma cleanse. And about six months in, I was talking with a friend about psychedelics. He was sharing with me how they changed his life and sent me a podcast by Shauna Holm. 
through the psychedelic salon, I believe. Nice. That's a great platform. Oh, so good. And that really spoke to me. I had already been doing some shadow, some deep shadow work during this karma cleanse, really looking at what it means for me to look at the history of, uh, look at my history of addiction and my experience with PTSD and reading these amazing stories of how people were actually healing as opposed to just continuing on with treatment was something that I wanted to experience myself. So it was clear that that was the next step. I hadn't done psychedelics since the 90s when I was in college. So, but I, I, I didn't feel any fear. I mean, I was a little bit nervous just because of the different things I was hearing, you know, make sure you have a guide, make sure you're not alone. And so once I had acquired uh, this medicine, um, things just sort of fell into place mm-hmm. from there. Before I did that, though, I think it's really important important to say to people who are listening, my journey is, you know, this is this is what was right for me. Mm-hmm. And so if you're listening and you haven't done psychedelics yet, it's really important to do the research. Every opportunity that you have to look into what's right for you and your body type, uh, making sure that you check with your doctor first is really important if you have a history of schizophrenia or if you've been hospitalized recently you want to make sure that this is something that is right for you so again this is my journey and i've done a lot of work on myself i've kind of been to hell and back a few times and i walk with people and some pretty dark stuff Mm -hmm. on a daily basis so i felt confident in my ability to do this journey so fast forward i was able to um, acquire this medicine. And I met up with a friend of mine that I feel safe with, who's also um, well-versed in this realm. And I just set up a blanket on her porch. She's got some beautiful property Mm. um, in California. And I actually ended up fasting the night before. And so I said a prayer over the psilocybin, it was. And um, I said, whatever it is that you're meant to, sh- to show me, I'm open, I'm ready. And pretty soon after, it, it kicked in pretty quickly. And so there was a, a spirit, this sounds a little funny, probably to people that haven't experienced this before. There was, um, there was a spirit, it was a sort of a telepathy experience. Mm. And so the forest started um, sending me messages. And what happened was it was a female spirit. And she used these two trees in front of me to illustrate the inside of my brain and how my mind wants to, or is addicted to holding on to negative beliefs about me. And she would say, do you see here? And she was sort of using this tree as an illustration. It was really beautiful. And she said, do you see here? See how your ego fights to hold on. And you see here, look what happens when the tentacles let go to create new neuropathways. You must let go. Mm. It's all so absurd. That's beautiful. Yeah, she kept repeating it. It's all so absurd. Let go, let go. And in that moment, I actually realized that I was sobbing Mm. and I was sobbing because I felt an immense and profound um, overwhelm of compassion. I had felt so much love and compassion for myself that I hadn't felt um, ever really. And so, um, you know, having done a lot of work around my addictions and my PTSD this this was a new feeling. It was it was a knowing that was solidified, and it came from within. And it's something that I can access at any point during my life now. Mm-hmm. That's really beautiful. I know people can't see this, but the uh, picture that you have behind you, all these trees, as you said, <laughs> like the tentacles, it's, it looks exactly like that. So it, <laughs> yeah, the, your background gave me a nice image of, of what that could look like or what maybe yeah. you're experiencing. I like that. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> sharing your, your experience with us. How was that to, like, I guess, revisit, um, you know, psychedelics a little later on, taking a break after college and also maybe um, as a therapist, kind of getting back into this work? 
Um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. Like how, how was it like, you know, when you were experimenting in college as you know, mm. a lot of young kids do versus mm-hmm. now that you're a therapist and, you know, maybe a little bit more internalized or, um, you know, wanting to do the work versus something that might have been a little bit more recreational and that might be an assumption of what your college experiences were like no no that's a safe assumption (laughs) absolutely so yeah that's a great question so I mean when I was experimenting with psychedelics in college it was it was seen as a party drug and so you would take these drugs and you would just immerse yourself in um you know I went I went to a college for the arts so we Mm. always had big warehouse parties where people were painting and playing music and dancing. So there's always so much going on that. And, and also too, I always remember having a hard time actually connecting, not connecting, but having conversations with people. It's not, it's not really, I don't see it as a party drug anymore. I don't see it as a, as a drug that you do to socialize. It's definitely now compared to then something that you honor. It's, it, it's seen as a medicine. It's something that you you have an intention and you create your setting and it's used to heal the parts of ourselves that have been cut off as a result of whether it be PTSD or addiction or even just the social constructs that guide us in away from ourselves. So yeah, compared to then and now it's, it's like night and day. It's very much, um, something that you honor and respect. And, you know, that's actually another, another thing that, that I wanted to say, um, having had a history of addiction and using psychedelics as a healing tool, I think sometimes people are afraid that it may, it may be addictive I love hearing all the different podcasts like Michael Pollan, um, Hamilton Morris, Matthew Palmieri. It's non-addictive. Psychedelics are non-addictive. And the reason is, and these aren't my words, I don't remember who said it. The reason is because with other drugs like heroin, crystal meth, cocaine, alcohol, especially alcohol, Mm -hmm. these drugs are about escaping, escaping your reality numbing out and getting further away from yourself, whereas psychedelics are about being fully present, showing you what you don't want to see, integrating the parts of you that have been split off Mm -hmm. and becoming your, your, your fullest self and reaching your fullest potential. And so you can't escape with psychedelics. No, there's been times where I'm like, why am I doing this again? Why am I putting myself through this? <laughs> Whenever, yeah, I'm like, uh, yeah, versus like, you know, other drugs. Like, you know, maybe you feel that in the morning after a night of drinking, you're like, oh, why did I do that? But mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's very true. You know, and I think some people can kind of fall down into the um, realm of, you know, maybe excessive use here and there, but um, maybe doing like some bypassing on on some stuff. But, you know, I think overall, I think with the, the safety profile you know it's they're they're relatively safe compounds for the most part like they're not physically harmful so yeah and uh, absolutely and i think with any drug um there's i mean i mean there's that one situation i think you guys talked about this on one of your podcasts where somebody drank too much water and she ended up dying mm-hmm. i mean with anything you have to be absolutely careful you need to do your research you know, talk to people, know, know your body. So important. Sweet. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about your journey. Do you want to like switch over and kind of talk about some of these, uh, you know, maybe challenges that um, you've been kind of bumping up against yeah. doing integration work or, or maybe we'll start off like, what is integration work for you? Like, how do you approach this work with clients when people come to you? Sure. Yeah, that's great. So um, this is definitely new for me. This is new territory after I had my own experience and realized how important it was to integrate um, these experiences. I um, joined a a website called the Psychedelic Support Network, um, where people, if they're looking for somebody who wants to do integration work. um, First of all, some of the questions that I get that I you know, because it's not yet legal, it's, it's a bit of a struggle. And so sometimes clients will call and say, well, where do I get these drugs? Um, which drug do I choose? And actually, I don't even really like to use the word drug. 
I prefer medicine and theogen, but some of the questions that I, that I get also, um, how much do I take? How long will it last? And also a lot of times when people call me, they think that they're actually going to be doing the drug in my presence, that I'm, that I'm actually going to be guiding them through their experience. I wish I could, but we're not there yet. So what I offer is pre and post ritual. Um, so meeting with me, doing um, you know a pretty thorough assessment, making sure that this is something that they're that they've done research on, um, looking into their history, making sure that it's safe, and setting the intention. That's probably the most important part. Mm-hmm. What is it that you're searching for? What are the parts of yourself that you want to heal? And then afterwards, really um, looking at what are some of the messages you received. Where did you feel it in your body? What are some of the important parts that you want to hold on to and incorporate into your daily life? Awesome. So do you get into like when people ask you about like dosages and, um, you know, maybe information about the medicines, do you get into any of that or do you kind of focus more on like intention setting and kind of creating that, that space that they're about to jump into? Yeah, I focus more on intention setting. I really, um, you know, I'm, I'm still so new at this and I still have some nerves around this because it's so, um, you know, like you and Joe talk about in, in one of your podcasts, it's, we, we want to keep people out of jails and hospitals. So I really like to just refer people to the different podcasts and, um, the eight common psychedelic mistakes that mm. you guys have on your site is really good, a helpful tool. So yeah, I use, I like to just focus on the um, integration and the intention setting. Awesome. And is there like a imp- approach that you use when you're working with people? I'm, I'm guessing I'm kind of talking in like the therapeutic approach. Like, do you focus like on a certain theory or a certain framework that you work out of? Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, I use expressive arts therapy. Oh, wonderful. When I'm doing, yeah. So. And I really feel like that in itself is a great way to tap into the the unconscious um, and subconscious the way psychedelics do. So the framework, a lot of I always use family systems. That's always in the room. You know, I always I, I truly believe that there's a root mm-hmm. to whatever behavior we're experiencing. How does it serve you? How does it not serve you? And so. I, yeah, so I'm typically using family systems, CBT, DBT. Afterwards, the integration part um, is to using journaling, mm. narrative therapy. And for people that are listening that don't know what narrative therapy is, essentially it's just an opportunity to rewrite your story, which is so much easier to do once your eyes have been opened to a new perspective, a new perspective to an old story. Mm. Um, and then integrating through using mandala work, drawing. A lot of times, I have I have a, a pretty decent size office, so um, having them stand up and move around. I think that's actually just to go on a little bit of a tangent. Yeah, utilizing movement to integrate is huge. Mm-hmm. huge. Huge. Um, I had shared with you bef- um, before in a previous conversation that I haven't done any holotropic breath work yet. Um, however, um, ecstatic dance, five rhythms dance, dancing in your home, any sort of movement to not forget about the body is such a huge part of integrating these experiences. So important. I'd encourage anybody to I I don't know. I my academic advisor um for the somatic program that I'm in, she's trained in five rhythms and that is really fun, really neat little practice. It's like you know, five different types of movements that you can do and kind of move your body um with some music. I really enjoy it. I think yeah, the embodying the the experiences, I, I don't know. I, for me, I think cuz this background of like trauma and and whatnot and being so disconnected and that's like kind of what breath work kind of taught me was like come back into the body. I think that's a huge part of integration. And I've been actually having some conversations. Um, I've been in Vermont helping my breath work teachers out with stuff and we're chatting about integration because they have a, I think a five day module coming up in November on ex- 
exceptional experiences and integration and, you know, really focusing on like the day to day things, like how do you integrate all this and and just function and, and find the beauty in life. But I think it kind of starts with that embodiment piece. It does. Absolutely. And it's so, so interesting because before my own personal experience, um, the tools that I would use to stay grounded, obviously I still use them and they work, you know, affirmations, meditation, exercise. But now that I've actually had this profound experience and I've gotten in touch with a part of myself that I didn't even know existed, it's almost like this warm blanket you can reach for at any given time. And so if I, if whenever I feel triggered, which I actually really want to say, I I don't really feel triggered anymore. My PTSD, it's almost like it had, it's just sort of left my body. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I get emotional when I talk about it, Mm. but um, yeah, it's that, that integration piece on a daily basis. It's like you have this nice warm blanket. You can just reach for at any moment to remind you it's different now. Mm. I like that image. Yeah, that's beautiful. Cool. So what type of challenges have you been bumping up against just getting started in this uh, work of providing integration services to people? So I'm, I, there's so many questions. So, so many questions. So first of all, um, how soon do I see a client before they embark on this journey? That's a question that I haven't yet really, I don't have an answer to. Mm -hmm. How many times do I see a client before they embark on this journey? Still figuring it out. Mm -hmm. How soon after do I see the client? And how many times do I see them afterwards? Mm. These are questions that I do not have the answers to yet. Yeah, and I think... You know, it could be really individual and, you know, just want to emphasize that this is more of a conversation because I don't think, you know, we all have answers to it. Um, and yeah. we're, we're trying to figure that out together. You know, for example, the, you know, how, how much time before a se- like a session do you want to get in contact with somebody? You know, when I, when we do breathwork stuff, I really try to cut off like any types of signups at least like a week in advance so I can kind of establish some sort of communication or rapport with somebody. And, you know, mm-hmm. if I have already had those contacts before, you know, signing up beforehand it is fine. And there's a, a quote that we like to use, like the process begins for that person or for you, if you're thinking about doing this, like as soon as the intention of I want to engage in this work starts you know so it's like as soon as you land on the page to do breath work and you're already thinking about signing up like the process has begun stuff is stuff is going to start coming up for you and you know I, i think touching base on i mean you can't judge that with anybody you know but like once somebody kind of establishes i kind of want to do this stuff you know, might be helpful to already start that process so somebody knows they're going to go into this maybe with that first intention, you know, reach out to a therapist or somebody who provides these services so you kind of can start that process. Because it is interesting to notice how much either resistance or fear or, you know, different dynamics start emerging from within. Once you know, you might start engaging in this work. You're like, Ooh, mm-hmm. do I really want to do this? Like, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think trying to establish some sort of connection as soon as that intention um, happens. But you know, that that's hard. You can't know that, you know. We actually had somebody reach out to us a day before they were going to leave for Jamaica. So we talked to them like the day before they were leaving to Jamaica just to go down to do some work by themselves. And, you know, in my mind, I was like, ooh, this feels a little too rushed for me to re- like really mm-hmm. understand where this person is coming from. But, um, yeah. you know, I think any connection is important. How do you, um, and so with your integration, are you doing any integration work right now? We did a a group integration work and then we get some stuff for people that sign up for our course. Uh, One comes with like a coaching package. It it, it fluctuates back and forth. You know, I've been doing a lot of like stuff with working with people with breath work and, you know, sometimes people just reach out and just want like quick little questions or they have quick questions that we can just answer via email. 
Yeah, it's a balance for me right now. I really want to start moving into actually establishing something a little bit more and, and getting more people involved in this. But yeah, trying to yeah. do the podcast and do grad school and then my internship starts. <laughs> I'm I'm a little all over the place, but I do like the group model. When we did the group course, I thought that was really great. We started with intention setting, and then I asked everybody to bring some sort of piece of content that, that they wanted to work with throughout the eight weeks. And then um, I actually encourage them to do some sort of final creative project to help with their integration oh, process. Oh, so the group model for me, I think is, I like it just because, um, you know, we're, we're all kind of holding each other accountable. We're all showing up and kind of being part of that integration process. So mm -hmm. that's the stuff I, I, I really want to focus on is more like the group uh, work and integration work. Cause I think there's something to the group component that can be really healing for everybody and everybody's sharing their skills and their stories. And, you know, it's, that sounds so amazing. It was a really fun, fun course to go through. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. And I think that's, that's another, um, important thing to bring up. I, I, I love the work that I do. I very much love my clients. However, to, to go deeper, that's, really the reason I got into be become that's the reason I decided to do psychotherapy was to, you know, to go deep and, and to heal instead of just treating. And this new chapter that is, is catching on is it's, it's so, so exciting. Um, I'm just really excited to do this work without the limitations of, you know, tiptoeing around the legality yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, and that's a huge part of this stuff is the legality. There's little pieces coming out here and there. Um, and I was just talking to a friend who is a psychiatrist and they were even saying that they could be putting their medical license at risk by even trying to prepare people mm -hmm. or giving some sort of advice or suggestions on how to engage in, um, you know, doing their own psychedelic work. And that's something to really consider as licensed therapists or being a medical doctor of like, can I actually even provide these services without putting a license on the online at this moment? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's another thing that I come up against. Sometimes when people call in and they realize that I'm actually not going to be sitting with them and I, and I, I do a disclosure. I say, you know, I want to be clear that I'm not, um, recommending prescribing, um, the use of illicit drugs, as much as I hate to call it that, um, I have to be very clear about the fact that this is completely a decision that they're making. And I, and I try to set them up with as many resources as possible, but it's, it's a shame and it's difficult, but I really have to detach myself from that part. Mm. And it, and it is important for people to be so, so safe so yeah, it, it is, a, it is a risk. And I know that more and more therapists, especially underground guides are taking that risk to help people heal. Um, mm -hmm. but I, you know, unfortunately I'm just not set up in that way. So, yeah. Um, and to go back to your original question, I'm kind of curious what you think about the, the time frame before and after mm -hmm. of, um, you know, how long would you want to check in with somebody before a session or how quickly would you want to follow up afterwards? Like how, how would, how do you approach that right now? Or how do you think you would want to approach it in the future? Yeah, that is, it is such a great question. Um, so, and, and those questions, by the way, came from a client. Mm. Um, and as, as this person was asking me them, I wrote them down cause I thought they were so great. So I like the idea of, of the immediacy, you know, not letting too much time pass. And so in preparation, it's something that, I mean, if you're seeking it out, that means that you're ready. And so I like the idea of seeing a client maybe three or four times mm -hmm. beforehand, just to get a really good idea of where they are, if they're healthy enough, um, doing that that background and assessment, setting the intention, getting, making sure that they're clear about what they want to get out of it, but also recognizing that we have to stay open to whatever the medicine is, is going to show. And then afterwards, I, I really like the idea of seeing them pretty soon after, I mm -hmm. mean, right away if possible. So you can hold on to all that, that gold that you discovered in your journey. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I really like that idea of like three or four sessions. I mean, that would be ideal in a, in a perfect world where you could create that. 
um, yeah, just to kind of get like some safety like assessments done and figure out like where this person's at and start building some rapport if, it, if it's a new client. Because I can imagine that it's kind of hard just being like, oh, I just had this experience. Now I need to talk to somebody. It's like, how do we really outline some sort of structure where it could be a, a whole thing of preparation and then and then the integration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also curious to hear a little bit about, from your perspective, when we're looking at the different types and agents that we're using now to help with the healing, that's that's a hard one for me. I mean, my profound experience was with psilocybin, but for somebody else, it might be LSD or ayahuasca. So that's something else that I'm coming up against. You know, it's, there's so many different experiences, which one is right for, for a person is, is hard to say. Yeah. And I think coming back to that idea of, um, you know, doing like some sort of diagnosis and trying to figure out what will work for the person. I think that is tricky in those areas where people are licensed doing this. And I think also, you know, I think I would throw it back on the person you know, and see what they're looking for, you know, Mm because if somebody is dealing with something like PTSD that, you know, it's really to the surface there, maybe doing something like MDMA would be more beneficial than kind of um, doing something like psilocybin where it might be a little bit more transpersonal. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, then you kind of come back to, well, people are dealing with underground markets and maybe they don't have access to everything. So also what's presenting them what's presenting uh, right right there in front of them. So I think that yeah. that's something to consider. You know, ideally I would love to see some sort of like little step program where it's like, you know, maybe start off with like breath work or some sort of cannabis work and then being able to like work your way up or down or, you know, cause Joe and I have talked about like each substance or each technique can kind of hit different corners and maybe one might be better than the other or or maybe not better than the other but it could serve a a different purpose you know something Mm -hmm. like mdma that's a little bit more empathic and heart opening um you know maybe if you are working through relationship stuff or some ptsd maybe it's good to kind of have that uh empathic experience um before kind of jumping into those more transpersonal realms that could potentially be a little darker depending on what's in there and especially if you don't have like a a safe set and setting where you know could possibly re-traumatize you if you know you're not, you're not set up to do that type of work yes yes yeah, so that actually brings up a really good point when when clients are looking to find a psychedelic integration therapist do your research i think that you know and looking into the difference between a, a therapist or a shaman or somebody who's just saying they're a guide because they've had psychedelic experiences themselves you really want to do your research and make sure that you're sitting with somebody who's trained because this is this isn't about a party you're doing this to really earlier integrate the parts of yourselves that were perhaps split off um, at a young age and you're going to be looking at the darker corners of your soul it's not a scary experience but you want to make sure that you're with someone who's trained that can really hold that information that comes up so it's not more damaging yeah yeah exactly it's important it's definitely very important to find somebody to work with that you trust and you know there's a lot of that safety and and good rapport there absolutely yeah some of the other questions um that have come up for me i recently got a call um there's a couple that wants to come in and and, um, do the integration therapy together and that's something that i haven't done yet i'm really really excited Mm. about uh, you know, doing the couples therapy, integrating their experience. Um, so, you know, even more questions come up around that now. So I like the idea of maybe meeting with them individually mm. in addition to meeting with them together beforehand to see what their um, own history is. Um, yeah, so that's going to be tricky. I'll have to come back to you and let you know how that goes. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, you might have more expertise in that being a, a marriage and family therapist. But yeah, that's interesting. I didn't even think about that, doing like couples work and doing integration together. I'm sure that's a very rich and powerful experience to hold a container for. 
Yes, yes. I'm really, really excited about that. Mm. So how are you going to do that? You're going to probably meet individually and then bring them in as a, a couple and, and do some work together? or Probably in reverse. I'll, um, I think what I'll do is I'll meet with them as a couple, um, get to know them a little bit. What are they looking for? doing thorough background history assessment, all of that. Um, and then if, if from there I'm feeling like I need some more information, actually, now that I'm saying it out loud, I probably will meet with them individually. I think it'll be really important to make sure that I'm aligned with both of them, Mm. holding each of their experiences and what they're each bringing from their own childhood and how that's going to play into the experience. So yeah, meeting with them individually will be important too. Something that's come into mind, um, and this might be really interesting, I mean, working with couples and maybe really challenging, but I, I wonder, you know, somebody had like a really powerful experience and then they realized like, oh man, I'm in the wrong relationship, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like how would you deal with that as the integration? I mean, that seems oh. like it would be super tricky to to navigate with those. Yeah, really big insights is like, oh my God, I got into this relationship. I hate my job. Maybe I just need a totally different life change. <laughs> and that could happen. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm really glad you said that. And I think that might be a really important thing to put in the disclosure that these, these journeys are absolutely about, I think that's the name of Michael Pollan's book, Changing Your Mind. Is that right? How to Change Your Mind, I believe. I, and then uh, Don Latin has changing our minds. So yeah, I get those titles confused a lot. <laughs> Something about mind expansion. Yeah, though. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but what you're saying, um, that will be, that will be an interesting thing because I'm sure that will come up. Maybe not s- always so much the, oh my God, I'm in the wrong relationship, but you know, who am I? Who is this person? Mm-hmm. Why are we together? Really profound deep questions will be coming up. Absolutely. And yeah. so, yeah, and, and incorporating that into into the pre ritual, um, letting people know that some of these questions might come up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure that's very like a slim population of people, but you know, it's something that we always kind of um, put out there doing breath work of like, you know, you had this really powerful experience, so maybe hold back on making any life major life decisions for a month or three months or whatnot. Like if it still feels really powerful after like three months, then, you know, maybe there's something there, but you know, if you get this deep insight of like, Oh my God, like I need to like quit my job and do all this stuff. Like, you know, maybe come back to your body. And if it's still feeling that way in a few months, you know, maybe there's something is there, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. We've had, you know, obviously a lot of couples come to breath work and I don't think I've ever seen that where it's like, like, oh, like this relationship's terrible. I think it's actually really enhanced a lot of people's relationships and open communication and whatnot. So, but yeah, I don't know. I'm always thinking about like those challenges ahead and, and how to nav- navigate Absolutely. that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Absolutely. And even in regular couples therapy, I say that, you know, people are in there to discover themselves and I'm there to challenge them and they might f- find something completely different from what they we're looking for in this journey. Yeah. Awesome. Was there any other questions that have come up for you um, or questions of clients that you've worked with? I I thought you said you had a couple things written down there. Oh, I already read those. Okay, cool. They're all gone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think that's it so far. You know, like again, this is just, it's so new new for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really, really exciting. So I'm sure you get this a lot, and I think we've kind of touched a little bit on it. Um, but you know, since Pollen's book came out, and I mean, even before that, but I, I definitely have so- seen an increase in inquiries um, yes. from being on the maps list, and they go, "Oh, you're the only person in New Jersey that offers integration services." So I always get mm-hmm. these emails, and some of them start off with, "I read Michael Pollen's book. I'm looking for a guide," and yes. there's doesn't seem to be a clear distinction in like just you know outside the psychedelic community of what psychedelic integration is and i think when people are searching for some sort of service they automatically think that integration specialists are some sort of guide and that Mm -hmm. they can offer you know underground services or give them access to some sort of illegal substance how do you approach that 
Mm, that's such a good question. Yeah. So first, first of all, yes, that's a lot of a lot of times people are saying, "I read this book," and thank you, by the way, Michael Pollan, for writing that book. <laughs> it's been super helpful for for people like you and I are wanting to do this work. So the difference between, um, yeah, I like to break down the difference between a guide and a therapist. Is that is that your question? Yeah. And how do you deal with people looking for guides or looking for illegal substances? Um, right off the bat, I, I just say, you know, this isn't about me guiding you to use illicit drugs. This is something that you are going to take full responsibility for. I talk a little bit about, you know, you know, I'm not a drug dealer. Um, I'm not going to be your connection. (laughs) I'm not going to be doing drugs with you. And a lot of times people get disappointed. Mm -hmm. They're really just dive right in once they feel ready or once they've read that book. And the distinction between um, integration therapy and a guide, a guide, what I like to say is somebody that you trust that's going to be sitting with you. Um, It could be a friend. It could be somebody that is not trained in any way, shape, or form, just simply somebody that you trust that can um, hold a safe space for you. That's, That's a guide. Um, whereas opposed to the, you know, the psychedelic integration therapy is this pre and post ritual where I'm not involved in the, um, the drug part at all. Mm -hmm. So, and actually I don't really get that many questions about, you know, where do I get the drug? Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've only had that once luckily. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I really, you know, again, it was just about saying, well, you know, unfortunately, that's that's not my role here. My role is to do the pre and post ritual. Um, but here are some websites and tools and podcasts that I would urge you to listen to before you seek out these medicines. Mm. Yeah, that's great to have like a resource list together to point people yeah. in the direction of. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. I yeah, it, when I uh, ma- help manage the maps integration list, that was some common feedback that we received when we put out a survey for the people on that list. Of yeah, we're getting a lot of inquiries about like you know where can I get substances and and whatnot. Um, How do you respond to that when people ask you, hey, where do I get this? Yeah, so um, since we have been getting a lot of those, I actually ended up creating a little blog on our page called So, You Want to Find a Psychedelic Guide? <laughs> and Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and you know, usually my approach is, you know, what are you really looking for? Why do you want to engage in this work? Like kind of, you know, the blog kind of starts off asking those questions. Is this work right for you? Like, you know, just because you read a book doesn't mean, you know, you need to really go down this path but then also like exploring you know just some legal therapies you know i think uh, the psychedelic experience and and the way that it's being portrayed in in the media it's like you know could be a silver bullet and this could be really powerful and this is something that i need and some of these other therapies might not look as quote-unquote sexy or like as powerful but you know i think that there are some really powerful healing techniques out there especially in that somatic realm of like using breath work or, you know, somebody that has trauma, maybe somatic experiencing Hakomi or, um, you know, yeah. some of these other uh, somatic techniques. Um, so maybe pointing them in the direction of, you know, maybe start with therapy first and maybe like you think that, you know, you've tried traditional talk therapy, but look at some of these other techniques that are out there that can kind of be psychedelic um, and be really cathartic. And then also I usually, you know, refer people to try out breathwork since Stan Groff was an early pioneer in psychedelic research and breathwork kind of stems out of that, or at least the holotropic lineage and how that could be really powerful. And also, you know, maybe referring people to ketamine therapy, um, maybe having them do some research on, you know, there's clinics all throughout the States now. And, you know, maybe that's an option to go down if, if that's calling to you or doing some legal cannabis work like our friend. Daniel McQueen over at Medicinal Mindfulness, he leads like cannabis group circles. Um, another woman, Sarah, that we've been in contact with, she has like, she does some cannabis psychotherapy and even this place, Innate Path over in um, Colorado, it's outside of Denver, you know, they do cannabis and ketamine um, psychotherapy oh, so and they're doing it in a, psych- a psychotherapy model, which is interesting. So, you know, you go there, you're there. I don't know. I I shouldn't be like talking that I know this, but you know, I have some friends that go there or work there and you know, it seems like 
you know, you go there, you use a substance in a therapy model versus like some IV infusion ketamine places where you go in, you um, get it and you leave. But, you know, there's places that are just kind of popping up now, like, you know, this innate path that incorporates some psychotherapy model. I mean, can you imagine using cannabis in that? I mean, it sounds kind of funny because people just don't think that has any psychedelic component to it or, you know, might not be that powerful, but... But it is. It is. When you use it in a very like intentional way and really focus in on the somatic experience and really yes. tapping into your body, I mean, you can do some really, really powerful work with cannabis. And now that it's legal in, in a bunch of states, you know, either medically or recreationally, it's very easy to, you know, possibly get access. But, you know, I think the education hasn't started yet on really how to use some of these substances in a really profound way. Um, mm-hmm. And maybe with more intention. So, you know, I, I kind of just point people in, you know, either therapies or maybe some of these legal quote unquote psychedelic options. And then of course, you know, retreats, you know, Peru, you know, you go to the Netherlands, truffles are legal over there. And, but yeah. you know, that's not really open to so many people. That's um, to be able to travel and spend money on retreats is also very restricting t- for a lot of folks. Absolutely. But I love the I I love what you said in the beginning that when people are asking you 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 put it back on them well what are you looking for um, have you tried these other um, avenues of therapy before you just go straight to this this thing over here yeah that's wonderful that's helpful thank you yeah and I can link up that um, that blog in in the show notes if anybody wants to check it out but yeah we've posted around a few times. Yeah, but it it is tricky because then like the compassionate, like empathetic part of me is like, oh man, I wish like we could do this work with people, (laughs) you know, because there's so many people that are hurting and looking for healing. And, you know, it's actually surprising how many people that are older that are looking for this. Like I've had some folks in their 50s, 60s, 70s, where they're just kind of like actually two people like in their 70s later life that are just looking for some sort of experience because they've struggled with things and, you know, they're getting closer to, um, you know, dying and, you know, they're like, I just kind of want to have this experience before I leave the planet. And yes, like, yes. yeah, why isn't this, why isn't this available for people to explore their minds in a way before they, <laughs> they leave? And that's really what it is where you're, you're, it's just an opportunity to explore your own mind and that's what's yeah. so beautiful about this work, right? I mean, we are, you know, we, we wake up and, and we go to these jobs and we never really go inward. We don't question things. Um, I, I think more and more we are. I think we're definitely becoming more awake as a society and a culture, which is wonderful. But the ability to explore our own consciousness and tap into the mystery of all of the wisdom that, that we have inside of us. It's such a beautiful opportunity. Yeah. I I can't wait for it to just be here. Exactly. Exactly. Have you had um, any clients like reach out trying to integrate like a really difficult experience that might have been like I don't know what the hell just happened there and I'm having a really hard time grappling what just I what I just experienced not yet no I haven't Mm -hmm. but I'm looking forward to it (laughs) (laughs) how do you think you would how do you think you would approach that that's a great question um so first I would just put it back on them and ask more questions um tell me a little bit about what you saw Tell me a little bit about what you felt. What was this experience? I would probably bring in the arts Mm. to try to map out so we can look at it together. A lot of times if somebody can draw or color or even with their body act out what their experience was, then we can look at it together Mm. and take back in time to that experience so we can examine it at the same time. And just really spend the time to look at, well, what was hard about it for you? Was it hard in a scary way? Was this hard because it's new? So just asking lots and lots of questions, being curious. Yeah, that sounds sounds awesome. Um, yeah, I love the, you know, what you do with expressive art. I think that's so, I mean, there's so much rich content there and like 
art, especially, I mean, we work with mandalas and breath work and I actually just went back and looked at a bunch of my older ones. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing what's still kind of the message that's still coming through that's resonating with me. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And it's actually in my face right now. How, how am I dealing with it? Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool to even reflect on old past things too. Oh, gosh, absolutely. And, you know, those you had said this earlier that you can have a psychedelic experience without psychedelics. And when I was going through the the um, graduate program at California Institute of Integral Studies, we were doing art therapy all day, every day. And it just felt like we were constantly in this psychedelic experience. You know, it was a really small, intimate cohort. Mm -hmm. And you're basically it's like boot camp for therapy. That was kind of like my undergrad without all the therapy, but it was very heavy on experiential learning. And so, I mean, I took a bunch of, I mean, breath work was a class of mine and, you know, did a dream retreat. So it was like a week of dreaming and doing Jungian analysis of dreams. Wow. And it's like, man, I wish I could find a cool grad school like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> CIS yeah, yeah, seems like it, it does a good job with that. I had another question. I'm going to just take a minute to try and remember what it was. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if it's coming back right away. <laughs> okay. Let me know. Keep me posted. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Is there anything that um, like you're looking forward to with working with clients? So much, so much. That's a great question. Doing traditional therapy right now, um, one of the things that I'm coming up, and this is to answer this is answering your question, I promise. One of the things that I I'm coming up against is I can sense the the blockage in some of my clients where we've reached the limit, you know, whether mm. it be through expressive arts, um, the affirmations, I give a lot of homework to my clients, um, read this book, meditate, check, check out this dance class. If you tried yoga and just see people stuck, mm. it's probably um, the hardest part of this work. And so what I'm looking forward to the most is seeing the light turn up back on in people's eyes. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking forward to the most is seeing people shift from I'm going to treatment every day to I'm healed. Mm. You know, what I'm looking forward to the most is just seeing people be more present with themselves and each other as a result of this work um, so they can have a fuller life. I think that peace and joy is so abundant and it can be had by anyone, but so often people are stuck in their mind. We fall prey to the lies that we heard growing up and just to really looking forward to people breaking free. Mm, that little piece about healing and treatment. I really like that. Like showing up to do healing work instead of thinking about it as like, there's this thing wrong with me and I need to treat it. So, yes. Um, right. I'm a sick person. I have to keep going to therapy. I'm a sick person. I have to keep taking this medication. No, you're not sick. You're, you're, you're perfect and whole just the way you are. Find that wisdom bring it out yeah there's a quote by uh james hillman who was an archetypal psychologist yes um, yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah and he there's a quote that really stuck out and it kind of resonates with that of um psyche or soul needs to be served not treated so how do we really mm -hmm. serve our our self in, instead of this idea of pathologizing it and needing to treat it because there's something wrong how do we actually serve that part of ourself that's yearning to maybe be healed or to experience something something else that's right absolutely and a lot of times people get attached to the idea mm -hmm. that there's a sickness and that this is their the regimen okay i'm a sick person and i've surrendered to this and these are the things that i need to do to really detach from that old story yeah beautiful I, I okay so i came back and thought of the questions that oh I was good good good, good they're yeah. more they're more logistical um in the sense of you know how do you i'm thinking about just uh being in the therapy world so are you doing like uh, therapy with folks or is it like when you do the integration stuff, is it more in the coaching realm? Um, mm. Like, Actually, I don't know if you do bill insurance or if you're operating, not doing that. Um, but, you know, there was a, a, an, an interesting article that came out and I might mess this person's name up. It's either Rose Jade or Jade Rose. 
Um, she wrote this interesting piece on psychedelic integration and some legal um, concerns. It, and there, there's definitely been some people that was like, that's way over the top. <laughs> but it is an interesting article. And I know I mentioned it on the podcast before about like ethics and professional boundaries and whatnot. Um, but operating within that, uh, within the therapeutic container and offering this work and, you know, how do we navigate that? And then I know some people that just don't do it within the therapeutic container. It's more like coaching or, you know, kind of like what I do with like the group online courses where it's like, you know, we walk through a, a, an educational thing together, but we're also kind of doing integration work at the same time. Um, so right. how do you approach that? Naturally, I just do the therapy. Nice. Yeah, I think that the coaching idea is it's so, so wonderful. I mean, I, I actually um, downloaded and printed out the integration workbook that mm. you enjoyed. Um, I love things that are, you know, already mapped out, bullet points, answer these questions. But yeah, for me personally, it's definitely just the psychotherapy, um, asking questions. How does that feel? Where do you feel it in your body? Mm -hmm. Um, well, what do you think about that? <laughs> you know, turning it back yeah. on the client, trying to appeal to um, their inner resources that that they're developing. Awesome. And then do you do any online or are you just more in-person work? Yeah, I only do in-person work. Once in a while, I'll do a phone session, but I actually don't. I, I don't like to do that. I'm, I'm definitely more of an energetic person. I like to do, you know, having the person in front of me so I can see I work holistically. And so it's really important to remind people that they can't just come in and focus on the mind. I want to hear about what they're doing for their body. I want to hear about their spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And it's so much easier to do that when they're sitting in front of me. I agree. And I go back and forth of like, how much online stuff do I want to do versus like in person? Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, in my more kind of, I guess, therapeutic or kind of shamanic thing, it's like use drumming a lot or pull in some of that somatic stuff, which you can kind of do online. But I think to be sure. in person, it's just so much richer. And, um, you know, that container is there. It is absolutely. I mean, and even just um, sitting here with you and doing this podcast, I can definitely see that it, it could be beneficial to do some online uh, therapy. It might be something that I look into down the road, especially um, with the psychedelic integration therapy. I mean, it's hard to find, you know, a really good therapist. So if I'm, you know, I got a call from somebody that lives on the East Coast. Um, so that's something that we might actually do i'll i'll keep you posted on that too awesome yeah uh do you get a lot of people reaching out from like all over the place from all over the place yeah, yeah. and again that's because i had put my name on the um the psychedelic support list and that's fairly new too within the past like few months to a year yes so, yeah. yes yeah, I'm really grateful for that platform. It's pretty awesome. And how did you find out about them? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I think I was just so anxious to put, get myself out there as an integration therapist. It may have just popped up. Mm. Filled out an application, um, had some correspondence with the person who's in charge, and then and that was that. Pretty simple. <laughs> Pretty, yeah, it was pretty simple. Um, obviously, I you know I had to prove my credentials and such, yeah. but. It was, it was, it was pretty simple. I noticed that Dr. Cole, have you ever heard of Dr. Cole Marta? Martin. Yeah, I think Marta. he is out of uh, Los Angeles region. Doing, He's one of the uh, PIs down there doing the MDMA work. Yes, 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 yes. So I noticed that he was on the list and um, he does a really great podcast with Duncan Trussell, where he maps out the clinical trials one, two, and three. Um, so anybody that's interested in um, learning a little bit more about um, you know the science behind the work that's being done, um, that's a really good one to listen to. Awesome. And this comes back to the question that you kind of threw out there in the beginning. What are some of your favorite episodes or favorite podcasts or, or resources that you usually refer people to or something that was really impactful for you? Right. Good. Okay. So, um, the one that you and Joe do on psychedelic professionalism, I think is so, so important because the more that we move into this realm, people are going to be coming out of the woodwork and yeah. you really want to know who they are, what they do, you know, people that call themselves shamans, 
don't be so quick to buy into that. So anyway, back to the podcast. So the, the one on professionalism that you guys do is awesome. There's one, Shauna Holm, where she talks about her personal experience and what led her to do psychedelics. Um, and that's on the Psychedelic Salon podcast. Another one of my favorites is the one that you guys do with Catherine McLean. Mm. I love her. She is pretty amazing. Yeah, she's great. She's pretty great. I, I forget where I first saw her doing a talk online where she just kept saying, can we please do something different? She was talking about the suicide rate of, mm. of veterans. Another great one is um, Joe Rogan, where he's interviewing Hamilton Morris. That was a fascinating episode. Wasn't that? <laughs> yeah, really? that was really yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, I love, I mean, he really takes a neutral perspective on all drugs, which I appreciate because we can say something good and bad about everything. So you really want to be careful about what where you get your information. Yeah, that that episode actually wanted me to reframe some of the stuff in our course on, you know, mm-hmm. we, we kind of throw caution to the wind with uh, uh, 25 i bomb and just thinking about, um, you know, because it couldn't be sold as LSD and, you know, that's something that people over, tend to overdose on. But yeah, just coming back to like the, the Hamilton approach of like, well, oh, it's not the drug, you know, it's just how we use it. And it's like, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, another one that I really like, a friend of mine, pointed turned me on to was this is a, an older one also with joe rogan with amber lyon mm. she does a, a really great talk on her personal experience with ayahuasca um which i always appreciate i really appreciate the personal stories as mm-hmm. opposed to not as opposed to but in addition to the science and the research mm-hmm. and then lastly i think one of my my favorites is matthew palamari mm. What a great guy. Was that, just, you're talking about our episode with him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The episode that you guys did with him is wonderful. Yeah, it was fun chatting with him. He's a firecracker for sure. <laughs> <laughs> there was something that he said during that episode um, about psychedelics being non-addictive. Um, he said, when when you when you're you're on something like I'm gonna botch this up, but you're on the phone. Once you get the message, you hang up. Mm. You know, whereas with other drugs, you're chasing the high, you're looking for that constant way to escape. Whereas with the psychedelic experience, you really do find the answer. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you have to keep going back to. Yeah. And then I I always appreciate that quote. And then I always think about something Dennis McKenna said. He's like, well, do you just give up on your teachers and never call them again? (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) yeah, you know, sometimes you got to call back. Maybe it's a year later or something like that. But yeah, um, yeah, not always picking up the phone every day and be like, hey, what am I supposed to be working on again? It's like, well, maybe write it down and and create some goals for yourself and and work on that. And then when you get stuck, maybe call back a little later. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Any other resources that you usually refer people to or anything else that was on your list there? I, yeah, I think that's it. I, I, um, again, the eight common psychedelic mistakes. I think the online course that you guys offer is, is one that I refer people to. I appreciate that it's so affordable also, by the way. And actually, a friend of mine, um, the same friend that inspired me to look into psychedelics in the first place just referred me to a website i wish i could remember the name of it it starts with an a gosh i'll have to i'll have to get back to you on that Mm. but basically it is um oh shoot i should have written it down i apologize no worries but but I'll, i'll send it to you and then maybe you can post that in the notes but it's just a very basic um and neutral breakdown of all the different drugs what you can expect from them oh um, cool dosages how how much time it takes to kick in the after effects hmm. yeah, i'm trying to think usually i refer people to arrowid um, that's what it is oh yeah that's an e e w yeah, e. there it is thank you yeah or no, not <laughs> E-R-O-W-I-D, Arrowhead. Yes. 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 I was thinking of Arrow. Yeah. 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 That's okay. a great, that's a great site. Um, it's a really great resource. And we usually refer people to Arrowhead as well, just to get their basic info. I mean, that, that's such a great archive of trip reports and drug information, history. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, anything you want is right on Airwid in a sense of, yeah, what's what what dose should I use and, you know, this or that. So yeah. that's wonderful. And yeah, since you're on the call, like how how's the course been for you? Was there anything that really stuck out for you there? Or like, what was your favorite part about it? Oh, gosh. Well, I just have my notebook right here. I have my own special little notebook for your class. Nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Gosh, I'm really enjoying all of it. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. I really like the breakdowns. I like the slides. Um, I love looking at, um, you know, the math behind it. So the different, oh, and actually, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. The interview with James Fadiman mm. on the Tim Ferriss podcast, that was really, really, that's another one I would refer people to. But I really particularly like how you break down the different drugs, the different components. I think that's helpful. And as far as, you know, what I might be offering future clients when they are looking for, well, which which path do I take? Mm -hmm. Which medicine do I choose? I feel a little bit smarter <laughs> with the way that you guys break that down. Awesome. And have you dug into any of the interviews towards the end of um the course no not yet oh great well you have to let me know yeah. which which one's your favorite there's i will I think we have 13 or 14 up there that's so great yeah i noticed Ka um uh catherine mclean is on there yep she's on there and she talks about more of like a mindful approach to uh integration work and we also included one of her raft meditations that she uses, which is really interesting. I actually did that in person at an integration group she facilitated. And it was a very somatic experience of like getting back in touch with the body during the, uh, the psychedelic, like kind of reflecting on what that psychedelic experience was like, where you are, what f like senses can you feel? Um, mm -hmm. And really just getting back into that, that state um, really powerful. That's amazing. What a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, uh, of, of all those interviews, do you have a favorite? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed Catherine's. I really enjoyed talking to uh, Larry Norris and Julie Megler of Erie. They're based out of California. And then, of course, I don't know, maybe I'm a little biased, but uh, I always enjoy our conversations with our breathwork teachers. And you might actually be interested in the conversation with Lenny. Um, his work was on integrating integrating the psychedelic experience or, or breathwork through mandala and artwork. And oh. his experience actually foreshadowed um, an event that happened later on in his life. So his mandala after a breathwork session, you know, he went down and just put a little bunch of squiggles on it and, and put some color on it, left it. And then a couple of years later, his wife asked, like told him, you should really go back and look at that. Cause I think there's like something there. And he went back and it, pretty much what was happening was right there on the paper <laughs> wow oh that's incredible i can't yeah. wait to listen i'm writing that down okay great good yeah well yeah we're about actually over an hour so um yeah any last comments or um you want to throw anything out there where people can find you sure um so you can find me on psychologytoday.com, Robin Curlin West, uh, licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I'm also on Instagram. I don't really do a whole lot of social media, but Instagram is the other one. That's where I have the address posted for the Psychedelic Support Network. You could also just go straight to Psychedelic Support Network. Which is psychedelic.support. Psychedelic.support. Yep. Yes, exactly. Um, is there anything else that I want to say? Just thank you so much again for an opportunity to have this conversation. Hopefully um, it'll reach some of the other therapists that are looking to do this work. I think it's a great opportunity for us all to be um, connecting and talking to each other, helping each other out, consulting what questions came up for you. How did you answer it? And also just a big thank you to all the people at MAPS that are doing such amazing work to you and Joe for this podcast, having this forum. More and more people are talking about it in a way that is um, not taboo. Mm -hmm. People that are reputable, like Michael Pollan, um, bringing awareness to something that's so important that could actually really help people. 
thank you everybody who's doing this work and thank you for <laughs> showing up and sharing your story with us today and uh, you're welcome my pleasure yeah it's been it's been an honor we'll talk next thank time you. thank you so much